Okay, we kind of went through most O exercise 5 in the previous hour, so if somebody wants to find out what we talked about, you can always look in the exercise folder on Frontier, which is publicly available. Um, we were kind of finishing up on assignment 2 here, and we discussed briefly how we could enter a quadratic program into Lingo, and it turned out to, to work. So, uh, now we know that. Then, um, there was uh, a question uh, B here. If the answer on sub-question A is yes, uh, discuss shortly how Lingo can be applied to solve the following problem. MFK sold 7,000 seasonal tickets before the 2002 season. Uh, of course, this could be a long discussion, if you like, and that's the reason why it's kind of put shortly in here, so um, the idea is really not that you should try to do this, because it's it's a kind of tedious job, there's a lot of data which kind of must be included in the Lingo model now. Uh, if you look at the textbook, there is just a short glimpse of uh, the data in one of the appendixes here, um, if I recall cor correctly. Uh, not here. Here you see kind of parts of this, of the actual information which, which was fed into the regression. And of course all these numbers must kind of now be correctly put into this Lingo model and then entered into Lingo to, to actually solve it. So, uh, so this is basically what I intended for you to, to, to write here. Uh, if you have a look at the solution here, you see in B that uh, I just wrote up the problem now, of course I have my square sum which I want to minimize. And then I have to add these constraints and of course on the right hand side now I must, must, uh, I must produce a forecast which guarantees me at least 7,000 sold tickets. That's the idea, if I sell 7,000 season tickets, of course any new ticket sold would be one above this 7,000 limit. And it says furthermore you know, as we have established that Lingo can solve this type of problem, we need to construct a Lingo formulation and press the solve button, basically that's what it's about. In order to do this, necessary data needs to be available, of course uh, you really don't have this, you just have a, a small part of the necessary data in the textbook. Of course you can find it yourself if you like, but that's kind of a tedious job, but uh, in this question we were only asking for discussion, not performing. So the idea here was of course again not to actually do it. If you like and if you're interested, of course you can do it. Of course, what you will get then is that we'll get four costs which are from 7,000 and above, okay? Uh, but uh, if you move back in time, uh, before the 2001 season, all that definitely did not sell 7,000 season cards, so that is erroneous information. They sold far, far less season cards. And that is the topic in the next question. <coughs> Would the problem be easier or harder to solve if the number of seasonal cards sold had been 3,500 instead of 7,000? State reasons for your answers, and uh, this is a kind of leading question. Normally, if uh, I ask these type of questions, the answer is easier. And the reason why it's easier can then be found if you look at the actual forecasts, which our model produced, and then we have to return to those forecasts. There were two different types of them, some were long term, some were short term. And uh, no matter which of those you look at, you can start with the long-term forecasts. They are, uh, maybe it was, I'm going too far now, aren't I? Uh, 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 it's up here. Ah. Yeah, these are the mad values, they don't help us much, they are the difference between the actual forecasts, and uh, here you can see the short-term forecasts, no number smaller than 3,500. So all forecasts produced by this model produces forecasts larger than 3,500, okay? And uh, the other model is the same there, I seem to recall. If you look uh, here you see that all numbers here as well is larger than 3,500 and of course if you add a constraint saying that every output should be larger than 3,500 it wouldn't make any difference okay? because you already have every output larger than 3,500 so that would 
make the problem very easy to solve because you could do it just the way as we did it. You don't have to kind of introduce this quadratic program to solve it. But of course, if it, if it were a constraint of larger than 7,000, then it would have impact because there's a lot of forecasts here which are smaller than 7,000, almost all of them actually. So that would have to be adjusted. Okay, that concludes exercise four. Do we have any questions? What I haven't learned, of course, is how to perform this multiple regression analysis. We have not done that, okay? But um, the principle is basically the same as the exercise we did with a single variable, but you need some software tools to do this. It's uh, impossible to calculate by hand. And I told you that there is a lot around. SPSS is the typical version which has been used for these e examples. But you can also do it in Excel. But in order to do it in Excel, you need to kind of have a special version of Excel. And typically, this special version is not installed on the computers here, so it's a lot of fuss to kind of make it work. So we have not spent time on telling you how to do multiple regression. Of course, we could have done that. It could be interesting. On the other hand, uh, the focus of this course is really not statistics as such. It's kind of more looking at uh, what we can use these forecasts for, for instance. And we kind of used it later on, didn't we? When we, we used this as the stepping stone to produce forecasts for um, how many Coca-Cola bottles to, to sell, if you recall this example we had in, in, the, in the next chapter. So uh, in logistics, we kind of do not necessarily focus so much on kind of the mathemat mathematical statistical part as we kind of do on the logistical part, so to speak. What kind of, what kind of problems would we, do we need these forecasts to solve? And in general, this is easy in logistics. We need the amount for cost to be able to solve an almost any kind of logistics problem, whether it's purchasing, how much to buy, whether it's how much to produce, how much to transport. Everything is critically dependent on our demand for cost. So we kind of need some knowledge on how to produce them, even though we kind of have it focused primarily on that in this course. OK. Uh, then we can uh, spend some time uh, talking about our uh, lecturing material. And there is hopefully some new lecture notes out here. Mm -hmm. So today it's the 7th of October. Do we have anything? Mm -hmm. Here it is, it seems. Last time we discussed, uh, we kind of finished with chapter um, 7, events and dynamic pricing. So there are kind of uh, three chapters left, events and hype logistics, event facility location, and event sequencing. So today uh, I thought we should spend some time on these three chapters, uh, perhaps also Sometime tomorrow we will see how it progresses. We can kind of now we will meet tomorrow anyway because uh, Oscar will come here to discuss the, the thesis subject. So we, we might as well leave some of the stuff uh, until tomorrow. Okay. Now this uh, title events and hype logistics uh, should of course not be completely misunderstood. Uh, what I mean by hype logistics is, should we say, a more philosophical view on logistics, roughly. Uh, you probably have heard about just in time, have you? Yeah. Is this a concept you heard about? Do you know what it is? Um, just buy and produce and Don't store. Don't store. Yeah. Okay, that's just in time. Yeah. I'll try to explain you a little bit what it really, what the implication of just in time is. Okay. So, to, in order to do that, uh, I start with this EOQ formula, or actually the total cost for the EOQ formula, which we have discussed previously in this course. And, uh, and now you should note that we kind of don't think of this now in a purchasing setting or in a buying setting. We kind of think about it as in a production setting. Okay, which means that this capital K here which is the setup cost element, is kind of 
related to setup cost, not order cost. Okay, so we think now we think how to produce products. Okay, and we assume that we can kind of change from one product to another when by invoking this setup cost, or we can stop producing for a certain amount and start producing again. Each time we do that, the setup cost kind of comes up, and we have to pay it. And then we have this other cost element of inventory as usual. And then the total cost function is the same as we have always seen. But now we kind of make a difference, okay? Now we assume that this capital K here is not a constant, but it's a variable. Okay. So this, as it says here, let's further assume that K, it should be italic, sorry, is a variable we can change. We can change it, yeah, we can change it. In reality, there's nothing wrong with this, is it? Because what is the setup cost? It, it has something to do with how many people we have hired, what kind of machines we have, isn't it? Yeah. So for if you have kind of unlimited resources in our factory, we can kind of produce as fast as we like. Okay, you, you, you can accept that, okay? That, that seems reasonable. If you kind of hire enormous amount of people and buy the most sophisticated equipment, spend enormous amounts of money, we can kind of come in a situation where we can make this K very small. But of course you have normally have to put some money into to achieving that. Now it says here, suppose we do that. Okay. And we we kind of don't settle for anything. We kind of really do it. So we minimize it so it's very close to zero. So there is kind of really no setup time involved in our production and hence no setup cost at all. We kind of are able to to start at any point without any delay and without any extra cost. So we kind of made some investments to achieve this situation. If that is the case, then of course our total cost function changes, doesn't it? Because now we have made some decisions which forces this k down to zero. And if that happens, the only thing remaining is the second part of the cost function, this h times q halves, or the average inventory, or the total inventory cost. So our optimization problem changes now from this kind of two cost element optimization into this single cost uh, optimization, which is kind of the, the lower white rectangle there, which says that now uh, our total cost function equals h times q halves. Uh, as, as always, it's hard to see here, so let's uh, change the lights completely. To achieve this, either invest enormous amounts of money to reduce K, or being lucky, and produce in an environment with cheap and extremely flexible manpower. Okay? If you kind of have very obedient workers, who kind of turn around on any kind of uh, situation, then of course you are in this, this situation. So, of course, the consequence of this is obvious, isn't it? If we want to minimize inventory, how can we achieve that? Then we don't have inventory, okay? That's how to minimize inventory. So the kind of classical just-in-time then is to kind of make to order, as we say, or produce demand as it comes around. So of course, as long as you have a very flexible produ production environment, you really don't need to bother with inventory, okay? Because uh, it doesn't cost you anything to produce what you need at any point in time then you'd make the order. But of course this means basically that it doesn't take any time to produce the product and it doesn't incur any extra costs when you start to, pro to, to produce it. That's the meaning. Now if you think about events. Let's think about a second dimension of just-in-time, which perhaps is not so much discussed, but is per perhaps more important, and is, th is, is what is kind of put up on the foil here. It says here that just-in-time, or JIT, which is the abbreviation I normally use, also has consequences related to uncertainty in the demand. And it says on the next stage here, a very flexible production environment, meaning K is very small, is good in an uncertain environment. It's easy, it's cheap, to change production between products in order to hit the actual amount. So if you think about this K, not necessarily as a setup cost, but as a kind of change over cost, that you want to produce something else, then of course if you are in a situation that it doesn't really cost you anything, 
to change your production into what is popular, then you don't need to gamble on what will be popular by building up inventory. Okay? So that is the idea. The more uncertainty you have, of course, the more valuable is this flexibility in production. So if there's a large, heavy uncertainty, you would expect that much more production environments will kind of try to be like this. <laughs> if you think about events, this is basically what has been done always, isn't it? And if you think about volunteers, they kind of play this part as adding flexibility to our production. Okay? And you don't have to pay your volunteers. And if, if a, an artist certainly wants to have beer instead of champagne, of course, you just ship them down to the, to the shop to buy it and everything is okay. Okay? It doesn't cost you any more because these guys, they, they go for free. Okay? If you need to, to get an artist at the airport, at a different time than the schedule, of course, as long as you have your, your volunteers, you use them. And you are in this flexible position. Okay? So in, in, in events, kind of this just in time way of producing is kind of more what you normally do than the exception. The reason why this has kind of been become important in classical manufacturing is that in the old days, when Henry Ford started this, this was kind of the opposite way of doing it, wasn't it? You had this very fast and flexible assembly line where the cars were kind of showed up. Every car was a T Ford and every car was black. Okay? And then suddenly other producers started to, pro to produce different cars with different colors, and of course then Ford had to adapt to this. The alternative would be an enormous amount of black T Fords standing at some kind of location in Detroit, United States, okay, which is kind of not very interesting for Henry Ford. So th this is kind of a very different situation. You could say traditionally events uh, uh, kind of have been just-in-time producers. They kind of use volunteers, they kind of have a very flexible production apparatus, so they're kind of able to respond easily without much more costs to changes. So they can kind of, they can kind of use the luxury of waiting to see what demand comes before you kind of start producing what is necessary. So it's, as it says here, hence just-in-time type of production is quite normal in events. Volunteers are an example of achieving necessary flexibility. So just-in-time is not news. Uh, it's, it's kind of old news in events. It's kind of how you always have done it. So it doesn't kind of raise any new issues. Uh, it, it's more like a different question in events. Kind of, is this sensible? Should you have such a flexibility? And that, of course, is the main point with all this discussion. There is normally never a situation where you would kind of achieve full flexibility and where you would, you'd, you would use no inventory. So there is almost always in practice a mix of this. Okay? And what has kind of happened is that classical manufacturing evolved from the Western tradition. Started in the United States with Henry Ford and moved in that direction. Then suddenly the Japanese started to produce cars, okay? and they did it slightly different. They had a kind of different phil 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 philosoph philosophy behind, and they kind of focused much more on flexibility in how to produce. The reason why they could do that is perhaps not so well known. Because if you know a little bit about Eastern culture, which I assume you do, Olivia, you should you'd probably know that, at least traditionally, in Japan, the kind of the manager of the company is kind of like God, okay? So everybody, if he says go, everybody goes, okay? Now we should start producing green cars, okay, we start producing green cars. Now we should do something else, okay, we do something else. Of course, in Western societies, there's a different tradition. We have unions, we have a lot of stuff, okay? So it's not so easy to make changes. It's more costly than it typically has been in the Eastern tradition. So it's kind of more a cultural thing, I think, than necessarily that one thing is good, the other is not good. In reality, practice is normally somewhere in between. So uh, there are different arguments behind this. Of course, if you get flexibility cheap, you do it. Okay. But normally flexibility costs. And then, of course, there is always a trade-off. How much is the value of this flexibility measured up against the, kind of the cost it actually in, in, in cures when you want to, to, to produce it. And of course, in Western societies, it's kind of costly to achieve flexibility. Because most workers kind of prefer to keep on as they have been done. It's kind of learning something new, doing things differently is kind of personally costly. So then you have to pay more 
wages to get them to do that, and of course that incurs costs. But, but this points to an important point when it comes to logistics, the importance of uncertainty. Okay? And we have discussed this when it comes to these uh, examples we look at in, uh, in, uh, in the newsboy setting. So again, kind of one way of solving uncertainty problems is to kind of create flexibility. But you cannot, you have to take care of the cost. Of course, if you are in a situation where cost is small to create flexibility, you might as well do it. Because you don't lose anything by creating flexibility. On the other hand, if uncertainty is not very high, then you don't earn many much in creating flexibility either. Okay. If you kind of know what's happening, you might as well plan it now. You don't need to wait to see that it actually happened before you then produce it. Okay. So it's kind of a two dimensions you have to measure here. One is the uncertainty, how much is it? The more it is, the more value flexibility gives you. The other one is the cost of achieving the flexibility. And these must be measured. Yes, there will be a trade-off here between that, those. Of course, there are other dimensions in just-in-time than those uh, we kind of looked at here, the kind of minimal inventory and the kind of effect related to uncertainty. There is perhaps a more important one in just-in-time related to quality. Okay. One of the things that the Japanese did was to understand that a modern society with modern customers and modern consumers don't like cars that don't start. They don't like cars that where the brakes don't work. And when you turn the tire to the left, the car should also turn to the left. Okay. So they kind of focused much more on uh, reliability and, and avoiding too much maintenance on cars. So they kind of focused a lot on the quality concept. And that probably made them rich in the long run, I think, more than perhaps the production philosophy of that kind of stuff. I think it, that's perhaps the reason why Japanese cars and later on Korean cars has become so popular. They started out being quite cheap. Of course, the costs rise. But as the costs of these cars rise, of course, today uh, uh, Toyota is quite s just as expensive as uh, Volkswagen or whatever. There is really no price difference anymore. But still, you have a feeling as a consumer that the Japanese car Japanese cars are maybe more reliable than German cars. I don't know if you have any personal experience. I have some. I, that is my impression, definitely. Of course, it depends on what car it is, but, uh, but roughly I, I still have the feeling that the Japanese has been able to focus correctly on, on this matter. There's nothing worse when you're out in the morning in a hurry and your car don't start. Okay? That's not nice. Okay? Then you have to call a taxi and, of course, in those days, it's the, bad, the weather is bad, of course, that's the reason why you take the car, and then everybody else takes the car. And all those other guys with German or American cars also have problems. So getting a taxi is not possible, okay? <laughs> and getting aid is not possible either, because all the other cars are, are broke down. So it's kind of everything gets bad together. Of course, this, this doesn't seem like a genius idea, does it? For, the problem is, of course, that you have to do it in the correct way. You have to be able to produce enough better quality at a constantly lower price as time goes on. Okay? You cannot come in a situation where the price is too high so that people start to buy German cars because they are cheaper and the, and the, and the, and the Japanese cars are, 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 are not enough reliable, better, if you see my point. So it's not easy to do this. Whether it's an accident or not, I don't know, but at least we can, we can see today that uh, what has happened is, of course, that the American cars has gone to the drain. European cars, not completely. But if you look at European, European car producers like Fiat or Citroën or all these French cars, they have man basic manufacturers in, in China now. I don't think that they almost produce any cars in Europe anymore. Uh, as far as I know, there's very limited car. This is perhaps an exaggeration, but. Uh, but uh, at least the car manufacturing situation in Europe has changed dramatically. Of course, what happened then was that the German car started to kind of take off to the Japanese way. They went down to Tokyo and Kobe and all those cities to study how these, they, these Japanese were able to produce these cars that kind of lasted year after year after year, almost without any maintenance. And of course, they learned something. So they kind of adapted this as well. And now we are in a situation where perhaps the difference is, is smaller than, than it 
any time. It has been any time. That, that is, of course, what's happening when you introduce competition. Is that this, this is really how it works. Okay, so to sum up, uh, just in time and events is nothing new. Okay, that's kind of what you have been doing all the time. And in events is perhaps more the, the way the other way around. You kind of start up with a just in time environment, and you're kind of moving into a more into a less flexible environment. Okay, where you kind of add more and more professionals, start preparing stuff, start planning, start forecasting them on, defining before the festival what to buy instead of making the decisions as you move along. Okay? So it's kind of reversed developments in a way, uh, meeting at a kind of middle point. That's kind of what, how I see it. Of course you can probably discuss this, and I'm sure all logistics experts does not necessarily agree with me on this one. But uh, I have a feeling that there is some, there is some sense in this argument. So if you compare event production to classical manufacturing, they kind of started out at different points. Maybe they will meet at some point, okay, philosophically. So you, there will be some just-in-time environments, other than less just-in-time environments. So what I mean by a just-in-time environment is, of course, an environment where you have kind of full flexibility, where you can make to order and then you kind of react to all kind of uncertainties. What we perhaps could say is that if you kind of look f future in time, you would expect more uncertainty. Wouldn't you? Yeah, the more globalization we get, the more it would be kind of you can think about music, okay? Uh, suddenly this artist is popular, okay? This artist is held in Japan and Germany and whatever, okay? And the week after there's another one. Maybe new markets opens up for this first artist, and all of a sudden he's held in Australia and, and the United States, okay? So you get these very unstable markets, okay? Then you have globalization and high competition. Uh, what kind of you should expect then is that the demand you get changes a lot. And of course to be able to handle that demand, of course from an artist's point of view you'll have to travel to Japan now suddenly instead of traveling to the United States or the other way around. That, that is something you have to react to. Okay? And if you have to go from the United States on Monday and then you move to, to China on Sunday and back again, it's, it's kind of difficult, isn't it? That, that, needs, that needs high flexibility. So. Um, uh, I believe that in the future we, we kind of probably see more just-in-time environments in the sense that you will kind of get more value for flexibility due to the fact that demand and certainty will increase. Of course, given that the, the world as we see it now evolves, meaning that transportation costs go down, information costs go even further down, political barriers for kind of selling products everywhere also goes down, if that kind of development goes on, as we kind of have seen it the last 10 or 15 or 20 years, then we would expect more erratic or more uncertain markets. Meaning that the value of having a flexible production environment will increase. And of course then more producers will have that, including manufacturers, service producers or event producers for that kind of thing. So in the long run, looking forward, we would expect more just-in-time, but not only just-in-time, okay? That's my point. There should always be a balance here. There's always situations where you, it could be efficient to do a kind of mass production way of thinking. Okay? You buy before the event, then you store, and then you use it, okay? because it's cheaper. Okay, uh, I think we briefly discussed postponement. Let's say a little bit more about it. This is, uh, again, kind of uh, this should be a more modern logistics views, okay? It says here that postponement means postponing your production to a time point clo closer to realized demand. So postponement is about trying to wait, okay? Instead of producing something now, you try to wait later to produce it. And the reason should be evident, okay? Again, if there is a high uncertainty on demand, the longer you wait until you produce, the better, from a production producer's point of view. Now, this is like football gambling, isn't it? Why should I gamble on Monday if I can wait until Wednesday by gambling? Because 
between Monday and Wednesday, things could happen. Okay, I could observe that certain football players have been injured, which could affect certain teams. And of course, this would be valuable information for me when it comes to my final gamble. So if I, I believe that Molde will... Who are Molde playing next? They are playing Hönefoss next. If I, today I might, might have the feeling that maybe Molde will win that match, but on the other hand, if I wait a few days, maybe some of the Molde players get injured or something might happen, which may be valuable information when it comes to my decision. And of course, this is what postponement is about, kind of. Delaying decisions until it's absolutely necessary to make them. And as it says here, this is good in high-risk situations. The t-shirt example we discussed previously was kind of an example. Even though we didn't do it, we kind of argued that the jazz festival could do this. Okay? They, they could, for instance, buy production equipment, and then they could have a whole kind of different possible motives, and they could start with the set of motives on Monday, they can observe what demand. Suddenly one was very popular, of course, then you concentrate your production on that for the, the rest of the week to try to maximize your profits. If you want to do this extremely, you can do that. You can, for instance, in the Jazz Festival case, invite your potential spectators or potential event participants before the actual event. You can, you can say, okay, today, this year we have this possible motive, or this possible motive, or this possible motive, and you can, can, can have a poll, okay? Or you can actually sell the t-shirt before the festival. Why do you need to wait until the festival? So there's all kinds of options here, okay, to kind of achieve these postponement possibilities. Postponement is, as we discussed just in time, a kind of uh, a tool which is more valuable the more uncertain you are. If you know what happens, then there's really no point in postponing, isn't it? Because I, if I know that there will be no injured players on Molde, there will have nothing will happen with Hönefoss, then of course I could make my decision today. And if it's cheaper for me to make my decision today than to wait, then I might as well do it. Then that would be optimal. So postponement, again, needs uncertainty. The more uncertain demand is, the more valuable is postponement, roughly. Then the third point here says, why not always? And it also tries to put in us. Why do, don't we always achieve postponement? And the reason is simple. Normally there is high costs involved with achieving postponement. You kind of have to wait to do things, and normally then you have to use overtime, you have to, and so on. Okay, then that costs more than the alternative. So postponement is normally costly, and of course it could be situations where uh, there is low risk, okay? So uncertainty is not, isn't very high, so then we don't need to cheap postponement. Why would we do something costly for a situation which actually isn't uncertain? But in general you could say that uh, if postponement don't cost, do it, okay? It, uh, <laughs> you don't have anything to lose. You know, if it's cheaper than the alternative, you definitely should do it. Even if you're 100% certain, then if there is a slight piece of uncertainty, you will capture that by postponing. So, if postponement is, is costless, do it. But normally, it shouldn't be, okay? That's kind of what, how a market should work. It should cost something. Because if not, everybody would do it maximally. Then it, would be, be, it wouldn't be possible to postpone, postpone anymore. If you think about music, we are, we are well known about postponement strategies, aren't we? Because there are certain musicians who play on demand. You have seen these guys, haven't you? And you're in the bar and a guy is playing piano and the, the customer says, could you play that tune? And okay, he says, and you play that tune. That's extreme postponement, isn't it? So instead of the musician to have a strict agenda for what to play, he learns any possible song. Of course, then he can react immediately to the demand. We don't see this much in professional events, do we? Why don't we do that? Have you thought about that? If you go to a concert with Rolling Stones or whoever, do they play on demand? Maybe the extra number at best, but they don't, do they? Why don't they? Do you think? 
Why? Because it's costly, isn't it? You know these groups, they don't have the same people, they have to, if, if you to re rehearse all your previous songs, then it's, it's a tough job, isn't it? So it, this kind of limits to the flexible situation, the guitar player alone, or the piano player alone, or maybe two. But if you have a big band, a lot of uh, equipment, a lot of uh, lightning and, and, uh, and uh, different heavy sound equi equipment, if you haven't rehearsed the song, how, how would the sound engineer know how to turn the, turn, turn the sound? Okay, so you see, normally postponement costs, but uh, in events we kind of see options for doing things differently. If you think about postponement in the football field, how would it be there? What would the post postponement strategy for a football team be like? How would the football team achieve postponement? Probably the lineup. Yeah, it's about the lineup, isn't it? Uh, kind of how you construct your lineup. Today you kind of have a lineup where there are certain backs, there are certain midfielders, and so on. So if you had a lineup with all kind of, with every player p perfect in any position, that would be a kind of mean to achieve postponement because then you don't need to kind of, you don't need to pick the team. You could wait until the last moment, and all kind of player could play at any kind of position. Okay, in a sense like the piano player being able to play any kind of song. Okay, the same way of thinking. Do we see that? No. Why don't we see that? Why don't we see football players who manage to play? enormously good on all kind of position on, on, the, on the pitch. And the reason is, of course, that it's very costly to produce football players. Okay? They are very hard to train. Okay? So if you are to train them to, to manage all kind of position, the cost would increase dramatically. Okay? It's, it's quite different to be a goalkeeper than being a striker, isn't it? That's two very different kind of tasks. And of course, specializing in each of them may be cost efficient. But so, so you see, Theatre would be even harder, wouldn't it? In a sense, if you are to play theatre on demand, then you would kind of have, you need to have a lot of text in your head, don't you? And it's hard enough for an actor to kind of get a single play into your head if you are to have hundred thousands of players in your head. That, but of course you could. There are certain artists who have kind of understood this early, and we have we have a concept called improvisation. What is that? Yeah, they kind of, they don't plan what to play, okay? They, they, they know a kind of set of basic ways to create music, but they kind of, they, they produce the music when you're there, okay? And you have the same in theatre, it's something called theatre sport, have you heard about that? It's kind of based a lot on improvisation, okay? You kind of, you improvise a theatre play. And we see this especially in jazz music, in the music side, we see it some, in, uh, in folk music. Uh, in the old days it was kind of common, you know, the big old masters like Mozart and Bach, they were great improvisers. And so this is again a way to achieve postponement, isn't it? You kind of wait to, to learn it. So you can kind of learn it as you move along. That, that is efficient, isn't it? Because then you can play whatever you like and if the audience responds in the, in they say they start cheering, if you do something you just continue doing that, okay? Instead of rehearsing your program. So there's a lot of interesting potential for post postponement if you think about events, okay? But uh, I don't think we have kind of seen the full potential yet. <laughs> so a few words about modularization. Modularization is classically, as it says here, a maximal amount of different products based on a minimal amount of components. We could think of modularization as a postponement tool. This is something that makes it possible for us to postpone production. Because if we construct uh, the classical example is of course the, the car engine, which is discussed here. So a modern 2.0 liter engine can kind of produce horsepower from 75 up to 450. If that is achievable, then of course you you don't have to have to make that kind of decision before the consumer decides directly. Uh, but to be able to do this, you, you typically need to 
have a minimal amount of components. And the car engine is very nice because it has a single component. Even though it, it's com it's, it contains a lot of components, the car engine itself is a single component and you can change its ability to produce power. The classical way of discussing this is the cell phones and computers. Okay, you kind of standardize on a kind of limited set of standard computers. There is a there is a kind of storage equipment, there is a screen, there is a keyboard, and you kind of have some tools which you can perform on. So you have you can have a, a graphics card, two or three different types. You can have uh, three or four different disk size for kind of the, the storage. Uh, if you combine this with some different screens and some different... Uh, basically that's how you do it today. You have three or four different sizes on, on, on the storage, you have three or four different qualities on the screen, and you have three or four different qualities on the graphical engine. And based on these nine or ten different components you can kind of construct a huge amount of different products. From the very low-end computer to the very high-end computer. Of course, the low end is simple, then it's the cheapest one of all, and the high end is simple, that's the most expensive one of all. But uh, there's a big amount of possible combinations in between here, which can produce kind of products which kind of fit most cons consumer tastes. So this is the classical way of thinking about modularization. And it is says here, the second point says that modularization may be cost efficient by itself. And this is important. If, if we normally think about postponement as such, we would expect it to cost something, okay? Waiting and waiting and waiting should cost. But if you're able to kind of define a product containing a set of minimal set of components, you can kind of focus on producing these simple components very efficiently. So instead of kind of tailor-making your product to fit the consumer taste, you tailor-make the assembly. Okay, so you assemble your product different. You you put your components to together in different ways to to fit the consumer tastes instead of making different components. So it could be cost efficient by itself to modularize, and if that is the case, of course you should do it, because then it's cheaper, and if your customer likes it better, then you should definitely do it. So this is a kind of different thing. This is more like a technological way of thinking. Okay, we can kind of put these components together. And then there's this car engine example, which is kind of the, the, the biggest of all possible examples, because you can... But it, it remains on the simple fact that the consumer is uninformed, doesn't it? For if the, if the consumer knows how to change his engine from a 75 horsepower to a 475, of course he will do it. Of course, so the producer tries to avoid this by making this difficult, by needing special equipment. You can't use any kind of computer to do this, you need to know how to do it. And if you don't do it right, then you kill your engine. Apple, they, they, they try to use their warranty to avoid this. They say, if you as an Apple consumer turn up one screw in your computer, then the warranty is killed. Okay, so th then you take a risk. So they want to prevent you from trying to change it yourself. Okay? by p linking the consumer action to the warranty. You know what the warranty is? Don't you? Yeah, what kind of, if, if it doesn't work, you can kind of hand it back, get a new one. That's the warranty. The problem with this is copying, isn't it? If you start producing a product or a minimal amount of cop components, then it's easier for your competitor to copy your strategy. If you kind of link your uniqueness to the whole product, then it's harder to copy it. If you have five components, it's and, and, the, and your competitor can kind of get each of these five components, he can do the same. He can kind of assemble different products just in the same way you, you do, and then you kind of risk losing your competitive power. Okay, time for a break. <laughs>